You're watching Shalom TV, celebrating Jewish culture. Funding for Shalom TV has been provided by the following. And by viewers like you. It would be difficult to overemphasize the importance <clears throat> of charitable deeds in the Jewish tradition. One need only turn to a Hebrew dictionary in order to learn that the biblical word for commandment, <clears throat> mitzvah, underwent an important change in the rabbinic period. It retained its base meaning from the Bible, that is, mitzvah as commandment, <clears throat> but developed the extended sense of almsgiving, reflecting the idea that almsgiving had truly become the commandment with a capital T. The Talmud puts it succinctly, giving alms is keep equal to keeping all the commandments in the Torah. <clears throat> this importance of charity is confirmed in the writings of the Roman emperor Julian the Apostate from the fourth century of the Common Era. Though raised in a Christian home, at the age of six, he witnessed the brutal murder of his father and other family members. Forever turned off to the claims of this new religion <clears throat> that had only recently become licit, Julian embarked on a campaign to revive traditional Greco-Roman piety. In one of his letters, he exhorts a pagan high priest in what would be modern-day Turkey to provide food for the poor in order to combat the success of his Jewish and Christian competitors. Not only does he give this order, but as a sign of the seriousness of his intentions, he also provides the food to be distributed. He tells his priest that, quote, one fifth of this food I am sending is to be used for the poor who serve the priests and the remainder is to be distributed by us to strangers and beggars. For it's disgraceful that when no Jew ever has to beg, and the impious Galileans, that's his term for the Christians, support not only their own poor, but ours as well, all men see that our people lack aid from us. It's really an incredible text. I mean, rarely in the ancient world uh, do you have a text from um, a Greco-Roman source that reflects on the indigenous practice of church and synagogue. We often read in Jewish documents or Christian documents about the nature of religious practice, but one can never be fully sure, if you have your historian glasses on, whether the texts are making uh, more uh, of a certain theological idea than was really uh, existent in reality. But this letter makes it clear to us that when the rabbis say almsgiving is the commandment uh, that's equal to all the other commandments, reflected a reality that Greco-Roman individuals noticed. If we fast forward to our own day, we'll see that though we inhabit a much different world than that of Julian, this particular feature of Judaism and Christianity remains visible for all who would care to see. In their recent book, American Grace, <clears throat> Robert Putnam and David Campbell demonstrate that religious affiliation is closely correlated with charitable giving. With the aid of extensive surveys, they provide abundant evidence that religious people far exceed their secular counterparts, both in terms of time and money that they dedicate to the service of others. Now, one might be tempted to cast a suspicious eye on these results and wonder whether routine synagogue or church attendance accounts for a good bit of the difference. But Putnam and Campbell have done their homework. Though it is true that religious people ded dedicate a lot of time and money to religious charities, 
They are also active participants in non-religious organizations. In fact, as Putnam and Campbell show, religious people are more involved in non-religious activities than their secular counterparts. In some, religious people are more generous on every level than non-believers. <clears throat> so naturally, the question arises as to why this would be the case. And here, I have to concede, I'm not a social scientist, and I'm not going to pretend that I can make sense of the causes that lay beneath the impressive pool of data uh, that Putnam and Campbell have assembled. I'm going to stick to what I know best, which is the textual world of early Judaism and Christianity, and try to discern from these sources what the grounds are for charity for the poor. Well, let me cut right to the chase. Uh, Professor Weiler advised me a very good piece of wisdom that as I develop this lecture, I should pose a question and then wait a while, not answer it, kind of bring the audience with me. But I'm going to violate that immediately. I'm going to <laughs> pose the question and instantly provide the answer, killing any sense of uh, tension and uh, uh, interest on your part. So I hope you'll keep listening. Uh, in spite of this proclivity. <clears throat> so let me cut to the chase. The answer, I suggested, is quite simple. For Jews, the act of providing for the poor is a form of avodah, that is, worship of God. And that's why Julian here, not by accident, is ordering his priests to do this. He wants pagan lay people in the hinterland to associate the temple with gifts to the poor. So let's pause for a second on this point. I think it will take a little while for it to sink in. For most modern religious persons, I, I think charity to the poor is considered a natural outgrowth of faith, something like the correlation of a good education and success in a career. In both cases, what's primary, that is service to God or service to mind, has some beneficial but still secondary effects love for the poor, uh, success, and advancement in society. But this is precisely what I don't mean when I say that charity is a form of avodah. In Jewish tradition, charity becomes the privileged way to serve God. One can see this in one of our earliest sources for the importance of almsgiving, the apocryphal Jewish work of Ben Sirah. Ben Sirah himself was a priest who served in the temple in Jerusalem and exhorted his students to take their responsibilities at the altar with utmost significance. Yet at the same time, he takes special care to correlate service to the altar with service to the poor. And so he writes, the one who returns a kindness, Gomel Chesed, provides a grain offering. And the one who gives alms, Osaitz Daka sacrifices a thank offering. The theology that's embedded in these brief lines is very well reflected in a painting from about 1400 by Andrea, Andrea de Bartolo of Siena. This painting is now on display at the National Gallery of Art in DC, where I personally viewed it this last January. And it's slightly mislabeled, which I also noticed. Uh, Joachim and the Beggars. In Christian tradition, Joachim is the father of the Blessed Virgin Mary and was considered to be a very pious Jew. And one can indeed see in this picture, the figure in blue there on the left, Joachim distributing money to the poor. But a closer inspection of this image reveals that Joachim's wife Anna is standing beside him, just to the right in the green, donating what looks like a jar of grain to the priest. Through the hands of this couple, God is served in two ways, by direct gift to temple and direct gift to the needy. Service to altar and poor are correlative activities. The same thing can be seen in this book of ours. At the bottom here, we have a depiction of purgatory individuals, you can see it's purgatory, not hell, because individuals are leaving. But what's important about this image is the means by which they're getting out of purgatory, 
There are two privileged ways in late medieval Catholicism. One is through the sacrifice of the mass at the top uh, far left, uh, but that's correlated to the bottom right, the gift of alms to the poor. Again, a correlation of altar and charity. <clears throat> It's hard for me not to link this image to an off-sighted homily of St. John Chrysostom, a well-known theologian and preacher who was active in the late fourth century and hailed from Antioch. He begins by acknowledging the honor that his congregation shows towards the altar in his church. That altar is worthy of veneration, he explains, because, quote, it receives Christ's body, end of quote, during the sacrifice of the Holy Mass. But this is not the only altar to be found in Antioch. Whenever you see a poor man out on the streets of Antioch after Mass is ended, Chrysostom urges, imagine that you behold an altar. Whenever you meet a beggar, don't insult him, reverence him. Well, let's pursue this a little deeper. In order to do that, we're going to have to pause for a second on the concept of an altar and how it functions anthropomorphically in the temple. Though most of us have been raised as good Maimonideans to believe that God is beyond any sort of material need, the concept of a temple itself requires that we temporarily suspend those philosophical worries. I know there's some Maimonideans in this audience, I hope you won't take offense at that, but to read uh, the narratives about the temple, you will have to, for a moment, suspend your uh, love and affection for the Rambam. The temple is the place where, according to scripture, God dwells. And as such, he's provided with a throne for sitting, a lamp for seeing, and an altar where his savory food is prepared. The altar functions, if I can be perhaps uh, a little bit profane here, the altar functions something like a tube, that tube in Star Trek, where one could be miraculously beamed up from one domain to the other. The altar is that spot where meat, grain, and oil are directly transferred from heaven, earth to heaven. So what happens when we take this anthropomorphic image and carry it over to almsgiving? If the altar has the special capacity of being able to convey food to God, then the hand of the poor similarly must be able to transfer funds from earth to heaven. Jewish beggars in late antiquity used to address their potential patrons with the words zechibi, which could be translated, make a deposit, a zechut, to your heavenly treasury, your otsar shebashamayim, through me. And so the idea of a heavenly bank was born. And along with it, the idea that making a deposit to this bank was like making a loan to God. Well, let's pause for a second on this image of a loan. As every creditor knows, to give someone a loan presumes a high degree of trust, a theme to which we're going to return at much greater length later in my lecture. Ben Sira, who we've already talked about, was not naive about such matters when he informed his students that many who receive a loan will regard that loan as a windfall. Instantly, they're rich and cause trouble for those who help them. In other words, they're not going to think about paying back the loan. They're only going to think about what they're going to do to enjoy the money while they have it. Though they speak deferentially when requesting money, they'll become indignant when repayment is due. As a result, Ben Sira concluded, many refuse to lend, not because of meanness, but because they fear being defrauded. Now, let's just pause for a second. A very basic, obvious items of wisdom here that Ben Sira is putting forward to his students. Not probably something that you would need to consult the Bible to learn. Uh, the insights uh, reflected here in these lines are, I'm sure uh, most of you were aware of even before coming to this lecture. Uh, but these insights are setting up what's coming. 
For if these warnings are true of your average borrower, even in the best of circumstances, then one would expect Ben Sira to be even sterner if we asked him about making a loan to someone who is truly down and out. But in fact, just the opposite takes place. He commends his students to distribute their funds to the poor without a moment's foresight. Lose your silver, he says, just a couple lines later, for the sake of the poor. Lay up your treasure in heaven. Here's our first documented use of this very important phrase find its way into the New Testament and rabbinic literature. Lay up your treasure in heaven, for it will profit you more than gold. Well, this is really a puzzling piece of advice for someone who just a moment earlier was so sober-minded about the risks that attend a loan. So what explains his confidence? Well, the answer I would like to suggest resides in a rabbinic midrash. Let me say, just one thing about this midrash, if you're going to remember any one thing from this lecture, perhaps besides how funny I look, um, <laughs> I would ask you to remember this particular midrashic text because my whole lecture really revolves around the insights of this wonderful tale. <clears throat> In this particular tradition, Rabbi Gamaliel is approached by a Roman citizen and asked about the rationality of his holy book. Can it be true, this Gentile asks, that your God commands you to give to the poor without a moment's hesitation? He's citing Deuteronomy 15. Lo yerea levavcha betit chalo. Don't let your heart grieve when you loan to the poor. Someone who conducted his affairs in this fashion, the Gentile reasons, would be out of money in days and in need of assistance eventually himself. To which Rabbi Gamaliel responds, well, what if a man appeared out of nowhere and asked you for money? Would you give him it? The Gentile replied, no, of course not. Well, what if he brought you a, a, a deposit as collateral on the loan? He responded, of course. That would eliminate all risk. I'll loan anybody money if they've got collateral. OK, then. Gamaliel changes directions. Now, what if this potential borrower brought you a commoner to cosign? He replied, well, I wouldn't issue the loan. And I was really amazed to find this in the Talmud, but it really says, but what if the mayor of New York City himself cosigned? <laughs> mayor Bloomberg, he's in the Talmud. Uh, so what if you bring Mayor Bloomberg there to cosign? He replied, by all means, I'll loan him the money. And here's the punchline. Well then, isn't scripture altogether logical? If you're going to loan when, even the, when the mayor cosigns, how much more willing should you be when he who spoke and made the world agrees to cosign? For scripture says, and this is an incredibly important verse in early Judaism and early Christianity, Malvei Hashem chonein dal gimulo yishalem lo, the one who's kind to the poor, chonein dal, is in effect making a loan to God, Malvei Hashem, and you can bet your bottom dollar you'll get your money back, Gimulo Yishalem Lo. It would be difficult, as I've already said, to exaggerate how important the theology of this verse was to early Judaism, Christianity, and eventually Islam. In the handout that I gave you, I hope that people get the handout. Uh, Actually, not going to go through that handout. That's for your uh, enjoyment after lecture, or you can put it up on eBay, whatever you wish. Um, <laughs> if I sign it, maybe it'll be worth a little bit more money, maybe less. I don't know. Uh, in the handout I gave you, there's a number of texts that speak to this theme from the three great monotheistic religions. So I give you a sample from the Mishnah and Talmud, from St. Ephraim, very important Christian thinker who uh, speaks and uh, writes in Aramaic, dialect of the Talmud. And finally, the Quran, and maybe we'll just uh, uh, go to one of the Quranic examples to see this. Uh, the text in question is here uh, before us. In the past, God made a covenant with the children of Israel and appointed 12 chieftains among them. And God said, I am with you. If you establish regular prayers, give zakat, 
uh, the Arabic word for alms. Uh, as most philologians would uh, concede, it's a loan word. Uh, it's pronounced zakat, but it's actually spelled zakut, if you uh, know Arabic, um, reflecting the underlying presumed Hebrew zakut or Aramaic zakuta. If you give zakat, believe in my messengers, honor and assist them, and make a beautiful loan to God. Verily, I will wipe out your evils, admit you to gardens and rivers flowing beneath. But if any of you resists faith, he will have truly wandered from the path of rectitude. The evidence on the handout, and there's much more evidence I could provide if you are interested, for understanding charity in financial terms as a loan is quite impressive, both in terms of its religious breadth, Jewish, Christian, and Muslim, as well as its chronological depth from Ben Sira and Tobit, third century books or uh, early second, up to the seventh century common era. And the reason for the choice of this particular metaphor is grounded in the fact, as I've already mentioned, that charity is considered avodah. So, so much for the first two points I wanted to make this evening. Charity is avodah, and charity is an act that funds a treasury in heaven. But now for a question I'm sure weighs on the minds of some of you. And that is, is this metaphor of funding a treasury in heaven, of making a loan to God, uh, worthy of our admiration. When I've shopped this idea around to different focus groups, as it were, I have found that the reaction is not always positive. It's a little bit disconcerting for me. I work on this, you know, uh, eight or ten hours a day and think it's pretty cool, trot it out, and people uh, instantly uh, uh, paste frowns on their face. Many are troubled by the idea that charity to the poor seems to be motivated in these texts by blatant self-interest. More than one person has wondered aloud whether these texts do not lead inexorably to the rhetoric of what is uh, sometimes called the prosperity gospel. That is, a gospel that preys on the gullible by claiming that tithing to their local church will allow them to buy a BMW and pay off their mortgage all at the same time. Most people are far more comfortable with the wisdom of Antigonus of Soko, who said, be not like servants who serve their master on condition of a reward. But let me urge caution before despairing of the tradition that I have just laid out. The first thing that needs to be borne in mind is that these financial metaphors come from the book of Proverbs. And Proverbs, it must be emphasized, vary considerably in meaning depending on the context in which we imagine them being voiced. Very important. Proverbs are not just kind of out of nowhere pieces of information, but they frequently presume a specific context which really drives the point they want to make. So let's consider also one of the most important texts in this tradition. I have here paraphrased it rather than translated it literally. Material treasuries provide no benefit. Otsarot Resha, Loyo Ilu in Hebrew. But treasuries funded by charity deliver from death. Siddhaka Tatsil Mimavit. The question that stands behind this proverb is how should we save for the future? A universal human concern if there ever was one. Just consider what happens in the political landscape of the United States when any politician tries to touch the third rail of social security. Rather than, so, so imagine that by some accident, happy accident, you've become heir to an enormous sum of money. Rather than giving in to the urge to spend it immediately, you ponder how these funds might be invested to provide for uh, your future. In front of you are two advisors, Warren Buffett, the famous investment guru from Omaha, <laughs> and the Baal Shem Tov, the 18th century charismatic Sadiq, who was famous for emptying his pockets at the end of every day for the poor so that he could start the next day wholly dependent on God. Mr. Buffett speaks of the prospect of a slow but inexorable set of gains over time that would guarantee a safe and secure retirement no matter how long you lived. The Baal Shem Tov, on the other hand, argues that God created the world out of charity. And as a result, prosperity in the future would depend on finding a way to ride with those currents. 
though it is technically correct that the Baal Shem Tov would build on your natural tendency for self-preservation, he may even use the word, establish a treasury in heaven, but the act of funding such a treasury, I think, could hardly be considered self-interested in the simple sense of that term. Loaning to God in this fashion might be better conceived of as a means for the religious believer to, quote, put their money where their mouth is. So I'd like to suggest that this way of reading these proverbs provides us with a deeper set of insights than that of Antigonus of Soko. For however salutary it may be to serve a master without thought of reward, most of us would want to know what kind of master we're called to serve that would merit such dedication. There is a deeper human desire to know and believe that the world is a place formed and guided by charity, that giving to one's neighbor is not just a Kantian duty, but a declaration about the structure of the world itself. Charity, in short, is not just a good deed, but it's a declaration of belief about the world and about the God who created it. Very important if you want to appreciate the value of charity in early Judaism and Christianity. It's a statement or a declaration about the metaphysical structure of the world. So that's my third point and final point for the evening, and now you have it all. Avodah, loan to God, and declaration about the nature of the world God has created. But let me say a little bit more on this last point. We've seen that a gift to the poor is imagined as a loan to God. In conventional economic circumstances, making a loan involves risk. The housing debacle of 2008 brought that point home with a vengeance. When my wife and I recently refinanced our home over the past Christmas break, my lender gathered all kinds of information about our financial holdings, the status of our employment, the valuation of our home, and even the nature of the neighborhood in which I live. The reason for doing all of this was to assess the risk the bank would undertake if they loaned us the money. For when they offered us the loan, they expressed not only faith in us and our property, but they acted on it. Or stated differently, by making this loan, they were making a statement about the neighborhood we live in and the type of people we are. It's a significant transaction, if you think about it. A creditor is a believer in the full sense of the word. In fact, it's not by accident that the English word creditor comes from the Latin credere, to believe. Think of its cognates, creed, creedal, credible, incredible, credulous, and so forth. Creditors are fittingly called believers because they, quote, put their money where their mouth is. It's never enough for a banker just to say he believes. The borrower wants to know whether the belief has teeth. And so I would suggest with respect to charity for the poor. Why is it, one might ask, that the life of Mother Teresa has moved so many people? Not just Christians, but Muslims, Hindus, Jews, even non-believers. I would suggest that her popularity rests on the fact that she has enacted a sort of faith that most of us can only dream of. But I would also want to contend that it's not just admiration for her faith that attracts our attention, but the statement that her life makes about the world. Though all appearances would suggest that it is Wall Street that makes the world go round, figures like Mother Teresa make a powerful counterclaim. In serving the poor, they not only provide concrete material help to the down and out, but they reveal to us the hidden structure of the universe. Steven Pinker, the famous village atheist from Harvard, once expressed dismay that the world showers such esteem on Mother Teresa in light of the far greater good that Bill and Melinda Gates have done. Gates, Pinker writes here at the bottom, cr uh, crunched the numbers and determined that he could alleviate the most misery by fighting everyday scourges in the developing world like malaria, diarrhea, and parasites." End of quote. Now, Pinker never explains how he knows that the Gates established his foundation on such utilitarian considerations. Perhaps, indeed, 
Bill and Melinda Gates had completely different motivations. In the remarks that are going to follow, I worried quite a bit about these as I prepared them for this audience. I want it to be crystal clear that I am not going to cast any shadow on what Bill and Melinda Gates have accomplished. In fact, I hold uh, their dedication to charity uh, with in the highest possible esteem. My beef for the next few moments is going to be with the commentary that Mr. Pinker has provided with respect to the Gates and Mother Teresa. So let me begin by suggesting that utilitarian value is not the only index for measuring the accomplishments of charity. For however much the Gates might give away, let's say $25 billion, their daily life remains by and large unaffected. They're still one of the wealthiest couples in all of the world. Mother Teresa, on the other hand, gave up everything she had to serve the poorest of the poor. Her total and unreserved trust, to quote Robbie Gamaliel, has been put in, quote, he who spoke and the world was created, end of quote. A truly impressive enactment of faith, if there ever was one. Now, Pinker, to his credit, wisely concedes that it's unlikely that his praise for Gates will win him more admirers than those of Mother Teresa. But this, he claims, is because our heads can be turned by an aura of sanctity, distracting us from a more objective reckoning of the actions that make people suffer or flourish. Mother Teresa, he asserts, was the very embodiment of saintliness, white-clad, sad-eyed, ascetic, and often photographed with the wretched of the earth, end of quote. But this, I think, is an amazing reduction of the supreme gift she gave the world. When she started her religious order, the entire premise of the organization was the gift of one's total self to the poor. One well-educated Indian professor of sciences, when asked about her admiration for Mother Teresa, said, I'm an unbeliever, but I feel I need an anchor. Mother Teresa is an anchor. So let me reiterate one more time. I have not come here in any way to belittle the accomplishments of the Gates Foundation. It's a truly extraordinary achievement and worthy of the admiration of us all. It's humbling personally to me. But what I've tried to do in the last minute or two is to explain why an Indian professor of the sciences, an unbeliever like Pinker, might find in Mother Teresa an anchor for her life. What I have tried to suggest is that the affection for Mother Teresa can't be explained on the basis of utilitarian calculation, the sort of explanation that Pinker prefers. Rather, the generosity of Mother Teresa, like that of the Baal Shem Tov, became praiseworthy because it was a statement about the nature of the world that God has created. And whether we are believers or unbelievers, I think it's fair to say that most human beings want an account of human goodness that goes deeper than simply crunching the numbers. I think most of us want to believe that the world is good and that in the long run, the world will reward a life of charity. The holy men and women of synagogue, church, and mosque help us to do just that. And that, I would like to suggest, is the deep reason why the financial metaphor of funding a treasury in heaven has become so, or became so significant for ancient Jews and Christians. The important point to be made through this metaphor is not what the individual was going to gain from this act of charity, but what the act of charity itself says about the character of the world God has created. So let me conclude. We began with a quotation from Julian the Apostate regarding the striking fact that Jews and Christians were generous to the poor. This led to our first question. What might explain their motivation? And our answer was simple. Service to the poor was service to God. The poor became walking altars wherein one could meet God not just an outgrowth of faith, it's the very heart of faith. 
This led to a second question. What precisely does this analogy mean? I suggested that just as the altar in front of the temple served to beam food from earth to heaven, you will forgive me that allusion to Star Trek, so the hand of the beggar with respect to coins. Jewish beggars, we observed, address their patrons with the words, make a deposit to your heavenly bank account through me. But then came the third and most important question, is such a mercantile metaphor really appropriate to the religious life? I suggested that behind this metaphor lies the image of a debtor and creditor. When one gives to the poor, one becomes a creditor vis-a-vis -vis God. And every creditor, I took pains to point out, is at base a believer. Loaning goods to the poor expresses a belief about God and the world he has created. Just as my bank made an expression of belief about me, uh, my wife, our house in the neighborhood, in which we reside. It is not a world, loaning goods to the poor then, back to loaning goods to the poor, and the world, the Weltanschauung in which it, it creates, it is not a world governed by those who gather and hoard goods in hope of a better tomorrow, but by those who believe that the future is best secured by sharing their goods with those in need. This is the reason I have suggested that figures like Mother Teresa or the Baal Shem Tov will always have more cachet in the public imagination, even surprisingly among secular figures, than people like Bill and Melinda Gates, which I reiterate is not to demean their accomplishment, but merely to make an argument for why they have not gotten the same reverence by the wider public. Pinker thinks that this wider public has been duped by Mother Teresa's aura, as he puts it, of sanctity. And as a result, they failed to make an objective reckoning of the actual accomplishments in question. But I have tried to suggest that human beings want more than just a calculus of material accomplishment. We want a Weltanschauung, as our Indian professor of the sciences noted, a worldview that provides us with an anchor. Charity to the poor, I would like to contend, or have tried to contend this evening, is that anchor. Thank you. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who can send a tax-deductible contribution of $36 or more to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media to help support our programming. Tax-deductible checks may be made out to GEM and mailed to GEM, Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. Please indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. And we thank you for your kind support.